Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Drum here in New York City. Producer, pianist, composer, Mark DeClive Lowe hails from New Zealand and over the last decade he's become one of the most important behind the scenes guys collaborating with the likes of Jody Wiley to Cy Smith to Jill Scott to Sandra St. Victor. Tonight he's performing selections off his brand new CD, Renegades, which is his ninth release. And the beautiful thing about this guy is one, he's not afraid to take the bull by the horns and creating art, which is something that's very thought provoking as an art as well as something that people can digest and listen to. Tonight he's performing here performing church which is his residency that he performs in LA once a month and he also does it here once a month here in New York City he's playing with his trio and tonight John Robinson the MC blesses the stage with some other special guests so sit back relax and enjoy Mark to Clive Lowe's church here at Drome here in New York City <laughs> CD and you have a plethora of artists on this CD. Yeah, man, it's friends and family, and I, you know, I love to create with other people. I feel like the, the, you know, the sum total is always greater than the parts. So to have different people come in and bring their vibe is a, it's a real blessing, man. It's that's what makes a record the record. I mean, Pino, Paladino, and. Sheila E and Omar. Pino, Pino is like he's a he's a mentor and like a big brother to me. We met at a random jam session in London about almost ten years ago now, and it's funny because I'd just seen Voodoo live, and you know, that was the record that everyone was playing in that, and I was like, wow, man, Pino, man, you're you're just. And he said to me, he's like, man, you really have your own sound. Everything we everything we played today, it's like you sound like you. And that was a real compliment coming from someone like that. And, and from there we just build. Like whenever I see him, we play, we record. I mean, I've got hours and hours and hours of me and Pino and me and Pino and little John Roberts on drums. And yeah, that's my dude. <laughs> Where were you going musically on this? Because this is your ninth project. And, you know, this is a little different than everything else you've done. I mean, I, th I think there's elements of everything I've done in there. But fundamentally, it's like the bridge from my time in London to now living in LA, it's, it's, it's kind of documenting that transition. There's a lot of friends and family from London, Tawia, Bembe, Segway, Omar, and Pino as well, and then crew from LA, like Miguel Atwood Ferguson, Nia Andrews, Sheila E, Mike Feingold on guitar, some of my boys from Atlanta, Little John Roberts on drums, Omar Phillips on percussion. So it's kind of like, you know, those two, bringing, for me, bringing those two worlds together. And there's a lot of stuff I make where 
Yeah, I've been very influenced by American music, where on my previous album, Tides Are Rising, the down-tempo jams, like a tune called Heaven and Quintessential, those were like me trying to, kind of trying to make American music, but it just came out my own way. <laughs> so this record is definitely reaching more for that, but still keeping one foot in the, in the UK sound. So it's like, you know, it's like I'm trying to make the best of both worlds. How is it right now as a producer evolving into an instrumentalist? Because you are doing like triple roles. Well, I, I mean, I grew up playing piano. I played piano from age four all my life. And, and it's funny because when I was living in London, I was... I was kind of trying to run away from that and escape it. I was like trying to run away from the musician. I was like, how can I deconstruct the musician inside me? And that was all that time I spent with, you know, working with producers as a session keyboard player, but playing less and less and less, just playing just the right thing and no more. And, and I was trying to kind of, I was trying to hide the jazz musician. And it's funny because it's like these things when they're, when they're in your path, you can't escape them. And when I came to LA, it just came full circle. It was actually the first show I did, like Nia Andrews' debut show. She's like, no, I want you to play piano. I was like, no, I'll play Rhodes. I like, no, I want you to play piano. I, like, I haven't played piano in 10 years. <laughs> and it's funny, because I was back on the piano. I was like, yeah, I, I love the piano. And then having great musicians around me in LA, um, Miguel Atwell Ferguson, for one, Dexter Story, great bass player named Trevor Ware. Um, Dwight Tribble, you know, playing with cats like that, it became more about, it's about the music, not the production. So it's interesting, it's bringing me full circle back to what I grew up on. And then in you know, my teenage years, I was into native tongues. And there's one point I wanted to be Terry Riley. You know, I was 16, grooving a jam and that, you know. Um, and it's funny where all that and through the UK experience has come full circle. And it's interesting coming back to playing the piano and playing jazz music, but with the ears of a producer. It's kind of interesting like that. some things about you that I find very interesting. You were on a grant for a year where you got to travel yeah. all over the world yeah. and that kind of really opened up Pandora's box for you yeah, musically. The irony is the girl I was seeing in New Zealand, she went to the UK for a year to teach. So I was like, well, yo, if you're going to go overseas for a year, I'm going overseas for a year. So I applied for this, this award, this travel grant, and I got it. I was all about New York. I wanted to live in New York. I wanted to, I wanted to play with Betty Carter and Art Blakey and shit like that. And so, I was focused on New York, but I made sure the flight went through London as much as possible because this girl was in the UK. So we broke up before I even started my trip, but I was stuck going through the UK. <laughs> and there was some stuff I loved. I mean, like Jungle, especially, had a huge, huge reson resonance with me. Um, so when I, once I ended up in the UK, it wasn't long before I connected with... Actually, the first two people were Dave Angel, who's a great techno producer, and then a project called Cyclone on Metalheads, Goldie's label. So it's funny that my first two sessions were like 
pretty much the great techno producer and the the kind of archetypal jungle drum and bass label. So I did those, and then and then I met up with the whole West London crew. That was Phil Asher, Four Hero, Bugs in the Attic, IG Culture, and these people. They were they were making a music that I I kind of I hadn't dared imagine. It was it was bringing together all everything I loved. It was bringing together the, the entire history of black music in one form, but it wasn't pastiche. They kind of a sim kind of absorbed everything and then created their own style out of that. So to be able to be part of that was it was a real blessing and taught me so much, um, educated me so much and inspired me so much. And that was, I mean, that was all over a result of this girl that I wanted to chase around the world. <laughs> And it's funny, I saw her one time and I was trying to say, like, yo, thanks to you, but she didn't understand. <laughs> some great musical minds here and abroad. I'm talking Leon Ware to Cy Smith to Jill Scott. What is it that you see and hear when you're collaborating with those different vocalists? I mean, even Jody Wiley has a different flavor. It's different than all the other stuff that you've done. Totally. Um, I really... I mean, I have so much respect for the history and the past and the, the music that brought us to this point. And I kind of feel like, in many respects, that music was, it has a disconnect to the present time. And, you know, what you hear on the radio has no relevance to what Leon Ware and Marvin Gaye did. Or, or where Jill Scott's coming from, or Shalimar and Jody Watley and even Prince, there's a disconnect now. So for me, you know, as a musician, I just love that music and to be able to connect with people like that, I feel like, I mean, not on my own tip too much, but I feel like I bring some of the vibe back to those people that they came through on. It's like when I listen to, when I listen to the Mazel Brothers or some, some heavy 70s shit that I, just makes me go, you know, wow. That is the vibe that I try and bring to my music, but with a little twist, you know, with it, with it, whether it's, you know, with the, with the electronics or with the house vibe or with the boom bap or whatever it is, I, I, I like to embody that. I mean, for me, I'll send it to Nate, who's playing drums tonight. I was like, you know, between the Mazelles and Royers, like that's it for me. 
And there's other shit. I mean, I love Herbie. I love George Duke. I love Ayato. I love a lot of music. But there's something about the Mazel Brothers and Roy Hayes, <laughs> Harry Whitaker, that whole school of musicianship that is very much my anchor. And between that and loving house music, hip hop, breakbeat, club music, jazz, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm at liberty just to throw it all together and see what comes out. Because that's very, very ironic because your very first record was a jazz record. It was a jazz piano record. I mean, and, listen, and listening tonight, I'm listening to you and I'm like, man, you've got a little bit of that Eddie Palmieri, that, I that you, world. <laughs> I mean, I, I love the Latin stuff. Like, I... It's just something about it that feels good. It's, I mean, dance music does it for me. And when it comes down to it, Latin music was dance music. Jazz music in its more raw form was dance music. And when the, when the music gets more intellectual and esoteric, I mean, I can get with that. I understand it. But as far as what really makes me move and, and just love it is... It's like the funk. It's 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 the the hump and the bump and I love that. So there's a lot of music where, for example, with with jazz music or Latin music, I haven't studied that per se. You know, I've touched on it a little bit, but it's just sounds that I relate to, and I think there's a, a huge aspect with this kind of music where if you if you study it too much, it's almost like you may pastiche it. And I don't want to pastiche anything. You know, I want it to sound like me. But I'm happy to give a little you know, nod of the hat to the masters that came before. And, and if someone, you know, if you're like, yo, I can hear that you like Eddie Palmieri. I can hear that you like Herbie Hancock. I mean, that's, that's a huge compliment to me. And I'm honored to be thought of in that way. <laughs> you've been able to formulate the live version of the Mark to Clive Lowe experience that you do in the studio to the club, like here in Drome or what you do at church? Um, I mean, a big part of studio work in this day and age especially is technology-based. So to be able to bring that technology to the live stage is, is a big part of that. And... Um, 
I, I used to perform with an MPC drum machine and, and everything was pre-prepared, like loops and stuff. And I did a show, I did a show in Hungary and Budapest in maybe 2003 or so. And they wanted an encore. And we'd already performed everything. Everything I had prepared in the MPC was done. But they insisted on an encore. I was saying to the promoter, nah, we're good, we're done. The promoter said, no, you have to play. So because the electronic beats was a, a huge part of the aesthetic of the gig, to do an encore, that had to be part of it. So I got up on stage and I hit record on the MPC and programmed a beat. <laughs> and I, mean, I was so nervous with that. I just, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I remember the beat came out really wonky <laughs> and I had to kind of compose the bass and the, and the harmony parts to make sense of the beat and it worked and it was funny because that was right in the thick of this time that I was very much running away from my early years playing jazz music and at the same time I was doing this and it really reminded me of being a jazz musician like the spontaneity the improvisation the kind of the the fact that it was reacting to the moment and the vibe of that moment and so from that moment on, I never pre-programmed the drum machine again. I was like, nah, every gig, I'm going to program it fresh, and we'll see where it goes. And that was kind of, that was jumping off the cliff without a parachute or nothing. <laughs> it, it messed me up at first, but after a while, I got comfortable with it. And now, I just love exploring it. I love, I love doing a show, like tonight here, whether it was the, the, the set with the band, or the solo set afterwards, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I, I know what the anchors are. I'm like, okay, we're going to play a Thelonious Monk joint. We're going to play Criss Cross. I know that. But I don't know how we're going to play it. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I know we're going to play it. You know, I know that I've I got the a cappella to a Stevie Wonder joint. I'm not going to remix that live. But I don't know what it's going to sound like. So that kind of, that, I love that lack of knowingness and for me it's a journey of discovery while performing at the same time as the audience experiences the same thing so to be able to share that with people is something i i, I love is it's almost a my mandate is to kind of say to people whether you do music or art or whatever you can do whatever you want just in the moment you live it and and do it Mark the Clive Blow for his time and his hospitality. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.
Thank you.